Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their financial support helps cover the costs associated with hosting and producing the Backyard Ecology podcast and blog. If you would like to join them, you can find out more information on the Backyard Ecology website or by searching for Backyard Ecology on the Patreon website. Today we are talking to Jennifer Seska. Jennifer is a conservation coordinator with the State Botanical Garden of Georgia at the University of Georgia, Athens. This is a very informal conversation that covers many different topics but primarily focuses on gardening with native plants, including the importance of regionally appropriate plants, some of our favorite species, especially for smaller places, cues to care and other tips when growing native plants, as well as some of the relevant programs and resources available in Georgia. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hi, Shannon. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for this invitation. Oh, you're welcome. And I am so excited to talk with you because I know that you and I can just completely geek out and have fun talking about <laughs> native plants and gardening with native plants. And this is just going to be a really fun conversation for us. I agree. I agree. Let's just dive in, see what happens. Yes. But before we dive in, let's go ahead and let people know a little bit about what you do. And then how did you get involved and interested in native plants? Okay. What do I do? So as a service conservation coordinator, State Botanical Garden of Georgia, and my task is to support all activities in plant conservation from education to research, restoration, horticulture conservation, um, conservation networking. So I have the most broad job description and the most fabulous job description. I've been at the Botanical Garden since 1995. I can't even do that math anymore. And so I have had my dream job for a long time. And I work with, uh, there's seven people in our science and conservation team at the Botanical Garden. And our focus is um, endangered species recovery, native plant gardening, plant materials development, invasive species removal. We tend to have a focus on grasslands, particularly Piedmont prairies and woodlands at our state botanical garden. And I spend a great deal of my time coordinating the Georgia Plant Conservation Alliance, which is mostly cheering on amazing people doing beautiful work on behalf of imperiled plants of Georgia. Now, how did I get into native plants or into plants? How far back are we going? Let's see. <laughs> That's up to you. Okay. Okay. So Yes, I've been in Georgia a long time, but I'm a Texas girl, seventh generation Texan. And I was born in Lubbock and grew up in Grand Prairie, Texas. And in Grand Prairie back then was just this little, tiny little neighborhood in elementary school and a grocery store. And I had this distinct memory of walking with my first grade class in a, I guess it was a, a prairie behind the school. And there was a blue bonnet. A Texas blue bonnet and everyone stopped and gasped and made a circle with arms spread like look out look out and children were like don't step on it because they'll put you in jail that is a Texas blue bonnet you know what that is I mean there was awe in the voices of all of us and that was just how you know we in Texas you take Texas history every year in school and symbols in Texas are very important. And but I love that regard, that regard for a wildflower. And that there was one and everybody's like, make a circle, but look out, appreciate it, but be careful. And my mom's a gardener, she's always been a gardener. And I I was a marine biology major. I knew I wanted to study biology. I just didn't know what. And I was a marine biology major at Florida State. But my last semester, I took field botany and I fell in love. I remember seeing roadside wildflowers and just thinking, this is, this is the best. And the plants don't run away. 
this is great, <laughs> or swim away. So um, yeah, a light bulb went off, a switch, uh, or maybe a reconnection to my youth. And I went from there, um, working at Atlanta Botanical Garden, then going back to grad school, and then into my green job. So that's a great story. Yes, I love that, just that connection and and that story with how your first grade class was all excited about the blue bonnet. Oh, they are gorgeous. I've only seen them a few times because I've only been to Texas a few times. Oh, they are gorgeous. They are gorgeous. They are. And I, I love that reverence. I love that people go to Texas to see flowers, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something we talk about in Georgia a lot. It's, you know, how do we get people that excited about Georgia native plants and that these plants are just regular in our lives. They're common. Of course, we know what that plant is. because We've just grown up with it. And it's something we, we say hi to when we walk in school or it's yeah. coming up in our backyard. So yeah. yeah, how do we get that connection with other people? Yes, because we do so often just overlook the things that are common and are in our backyards because they are normal. And so, of course, they can't be interesting or that's kind of the way our mindset is. But that's yeah. not true. And because, I mean, everybody loves the blue bonnets in Texas. And <laughs> yet, I mean, it'd be easy for people in Texas to say, oh, yeah, it's a blue bonnet. But your story right there says, no, people can actually get really excited. So, yes, mm -hmm. that's one of the things I want to do, too, is help people really get that inspiration and excitement and awe about yes. our native plants and animals both right they're also cool they are and their interactions I know I, I I start several talks I've started with do not disparage the dandelion in front of Jennifer Siska <laughs> <laughs> I have high regard for dandelions so just so you know my heart and so we started off on a good beat you know good foot a good beat uh, know that I love dandelions and um, and you should too. And come look, come look at these hairs. They're so pretty. And look at the seeds. It looks like a little tutu, the little pappas. I mean, uh, you know, but getting that chance to show people, like you said, and geek out on all the goodness of plants and then watching that, watch how the bees are working. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I do that. I do that with, with people at the botanical garden, like, come see, come see. Or my, you know, our car do that or people walking by on the sidewalk and they say, hi, I'm like, have you seen this? <laughs> accosting people with botany <laughs> that's not normal everybody doesn't do that I, we do it i know you do it <laughs> it's just our joy isn't it, it comes bubbling out yes hmm. and i mean i'll do it with the flower i will do it with a lichen i'll do it with the um, millipede i mean I, i'm just a total nature geek and even yeah. if i don't know what it is i can still go oh, Ooh, and get all yeah. excited about it and start trying to figure out what it is and anything I can figure out about it and learn. Exactly, exactly. And I think about, it's funny, uh, I think about when I was a kid and you know, kids ask lots of questions, but I, I kind of had a reputation in my family for asking lots of questions. So I guess as a scientist, it's always been in there, just that curiosity. And I wonder, and do you think, and I, do you think it could be a, my husband and I were both working from home during COVID. Apparently, I'm still doing that and asking lots of questions and hypothesizing about, well, look at the spider. Do you think this? And do you, I wonder what is that doing? And he's like, okay, so that's question 24. <laughs> but I'm just, you don't have to answer. I'm just, you know, wondering. But I can imagine that stiff might be different for, from some people. But I get it, Shannon. I, I like to explore and learn about all things, all things nature, for sure. And see, I'm lucky because my husband's also a wildlife biologist. Oh, so cool. he does the same thing. And we don't only, we don't just ask questions about the spiders. We name them. So the little jumping spider that's in the kitchen, that's Sal for Sal. Oh, okay, I was going to say, like, and... species name or Fred? Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. Well, we, yes. We do that. It's usually Mr. Spider or Mrs. Spider. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sal in your kitchen. I know I love well, them all so much. Yeah. 
Well, if it's just like a regular spider, then it might be Fred or Mr. Oh. Spider or something like that. But if we know it's a jumping spider, Sal is usually the name that it gets named. Sal the jumping spider. Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah, jumping spiders are in the family Celticidae. So what else would you call it? See, I did not know this. <laughs> it's just a reference to a cousin. Oh, that's marvelous. Perfect. He might be a little weird to some people. No, I think that our jumping spiders may all become Sal as well. <laughs> Sal and Sally. Yes. Perfect. Thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, and do you know how to tell the mature males from the females or immature males? I have no idea, actually. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So this works for all the spiders that I know of. Okay. The true spiders, not the harvest men, which are the daddy long legs and stuff, but your okay. true spiders. If you look at the front at, well, we'll, we'll call it the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, if you see a little boxing gloves there. Yes. Yes. That's the mature males. That's the pedipalps for fertilizing the female and transferring the sperm. Ah. If they don't have those, they're not mature males. Now you can't tell immature male from female as far as I know, okay. but looking for those pedipalps, you can tell the males. Thank you for that. I do love the little pedipalps. I have watched observe those. Yes. I know. I, I was at a meeting, native plant meeting, talking at a, a small town in South Georgia about putting native plants throughout their city. It was an icebreaker. And if you could do your career again, what would you do? And I was like, I would study spiders. <laughs> and the whole room was like, really? Ooh, no, I'm like, no, they're fascinating. They're beautiful. So I would, I would. I need to put more time into them. I love them. <laughs> Yeah, so you were talking about gardening with native plants, and I know right now we're recording this, it's April, it's Native Plant Month, everything is blooming or starting to bloom as far as the spring ephemerals, at least down here in Kentucky, you're up in Georgia, so you're right. a little bit further ahead, I think, especially looking out your window, you're a little bit greener than us, mm -hmm. but not by much, maybe a couple of weeks, and so... Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about native plant gardening and how to get started. Good, good. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. We just actually had our uh, spring plant sale at the Botanical Garden and it went so well. So many people are excited about gardening. And yes. So warmed up in my heart to hear that what gardening is one of the fastest growing hobbies in the United States through yes. COVID in the last few years. I think that's just the best news. Yes. And the interest in native plants is really yes. taking off too. either the native plants for themselves, because we've got some gorgeous native plants that really do well in landscaped areas, or because people are getting more interested in pollinators. And the best way to plant for pollinators is to plant native plants. So there's multiple different things, I think, really driving the interest, but yeah, there's lots of people getting really interested in native plants, I think, in the garden setting, which is awesome. It is awesome. And we work hard at the State Botanical Garden of Georgia and our other, you know, sister and brother colleagues at other botanical gardens too, for sure, nature centers and all, to help sing those songs about native plants. Come, come look at this plant. This is a beautiful plant. It happens to be native to Georgia. It happens to be ecologically relevant happens to be a great supporter of lots of insect diversity but it's also just a great garden plant you want this in your garden please plant this and working hard to get um, we have these goals in our science and conservation team if if we could get everybody to plant one appropriate milkweed a mountain mint a goldenrod a small one a small goldenrod not one of the tall blueberry, you know, just a few native plants, incorporate a few native plants, some really big supporters of insect diversity. We could retire and go home. That would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> or we could just focus on critically imperiled plants that need extra help. But if we could get everybody to, to pop something like that into their home garden or their patio, you know, their mailbox garden, their deck, their windowsill, um, that would be very significant scientifically for biodiversity and from our hearts. 
Yes. Yes, exactly. And one of the things that I tell lots of people when I'm talking to them about gardening with native plants, or they're talking to me in my nursery about what plants would work well, they're like, well, I kill everything. So I need something that's really easy to take care of. And I'm like, once you get the native of plants established, Mm -hmm. they are easy because they're adapted to our crazy soils and crazy weather and all the craziness here. So they don't have to be babied. You have to get them started. Everything has to be babied a little bit when you're getting them started, but then you can kind of, kind of forget about them in many cases. Right. I think that is true. I will say in Georgia, we have you, you talk about wonky soils. Oh, we might have you beat, I think, on the degraded wonky soils. You know, our famous Georgia red clay. Yes, are... you've got me beat on Georgia red clay. No oh, question. Gosh. So people will go and buy a package of wildflower seeds and follow the instructions, scratch these into your soil and water it, and you will have bountiful flowers. No, no, not in our, I mean, in, if you have lovely soil, yes, of course, but so many of our neighborhoods, so many of our, the inherited yards, our inherited gardens, the soil's just so bad. So we, we're like, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's, let's go up. We're going to amend up, bring in some, st- some good, yummy soil, some compost. Then you can plant. So bringing people around. And, you know, I was taught too, you get, you get your garden, you, you till it, and you amend it and do things. And now we're t- telling people, maybe poke holes in it, don't till it and um, and amend up and then plant your plants and give them time and then they will they will spread for you but they they need that boost especially in georgia and teaching people you know we're an ag state but we sure work that soil hard and i think unnecessarily hard perhaps for home gardens for perennial beds we can we can relax a lot in our gardening and not till and not fuss and not do and not clean and tidy and mulch everything and cut everything keep it all precise yeah yes I agree and you said something a few minutes ago I want to go back to okay and that was when you mentioned an appropriate milkweed oh (laughs) you did pick up on that oh yes because I know you and I in another conversation once before that we were having Mm -hmm. um, not for the podcast or anything You said something that really surprised me that I didn't know, and I'm guessing lots of other people don't know about milkweeds in Georgia. Right. And you know, to own up, to be honest, full disclosure, I didn't know either. So if you look on the internet and you look at most maps, I don't think many, all these maps have been corrected. Common milkweed, Asclepius syriaca is not native to Georgia. And while it's a wonderful milkweed for monarch butterflies, in Georgia, it's a colonizer species. It's an aggressive species. Would I call it invasive? That's a legal term. No, because we're trying to put a stop on it. But colleagues, botanists like Linda Chafin, Tom Patrick, went through older bearing specimens and looked at the early records of common milkweed in Georgia. And they were all, they realized garden escapes. And Tom Patrick has since passed, he's state botanist, Georgia Department of Natural Resources. He used to say that one of the things that kept him up at night was thinking that common milkweed was going to spread, spread in Georgia and take over plant communities. You know, a botanist carries many worries, but he really carries that common milkweed worry. So common milkweed, while it's great for monarch butterflies, it's not great for Georgia plant communities. And there are so many other wonderful species to plant. We have um, on our website recommendations that we and our partners came up with for the best Georgia milkweeds and then the ones to stay away from. But again, in full disclosure, we used to propagate and sell that common milkweed at the botanical garden. I had it in my home, my own home garden. I shared seeds of it with friends and I've had to undo that and replace my own self. And with the most wonderful things through this process, you know, we did have a workshop 
talking about best milkweeds for Georgia and talking about these herbarium specimens and how we were, now that we've learning this about common milkweed in Georgia, um, Monarchs Across Georgia is an amazing outreach organization. They do wonderful education programs. They sponsor a lot of wonderful science and their main mission is supporting monarchs. But if you look up our literature that we've produced with partners, they are standing shoulder to shoulder with us because they realize, they understand that for Georgia, we need about, you know, mosaic of habitats, lots of different species and common milkweed is just not a good friend for us here in Georgia. And there are no, the pressures that may keep it in check in other states aren't here and it will just go, go, go. And it would spread, you know, seeds would fly away and spread and spread. So that was a bold step for monarchs across Georgia to stand in solidarity with the plant community botanist on that. But I was real proud for that, those conversations. And, you know, they wanted to talk about the evidence and then, you know, let's get out some literature. Let's look at these, you know, let's really walk around. It was, it was a, a hearty conversation or four, <laughs> but we got there together. And we were real proud for that. So yes, I do. I tend to say the appropriate milkweed <laughs> for Georgia. Yes, which is, I think, really important to bring up because, yeah, you look at the maps online and everything like that and in all the books too, which, I mean, it's understandable in the books because the books are older. It's harder to update them. Right. But even on the internet, you see common milkweed as being listed and shown as being native pretty much throughout the entire eastern U.S. And right. yeah, I had no clue about Georgia until you said that. And that's, yeah, I didn't either. And, you know, in organizations that are working on behalf of monarchs and they're giving away milkweed seed, they're doing, that is some beautiful heart-centered work, important mm -hmm. work. And, and we've been reaching out and my partners too over the years and just saying, hey, we, science is caught up. We're sharing some things that we've learned on here, but here's other, other seeds, here's other species that we can promote. So yeah. um, we're getting caught up with ourselves. <laughs> and I love that too, because you're working with your partners and everybody's coming together with it. And yeah, science is always learning new things. I mean, we learn new things in life every day. Why shouldn't science be the same way and constantly learning? And sometimes we have to go, okay, what we thought we knew, we need to revise it a little bit. We've learned better, learned more. Yeah. And I, I'm very comfortable with that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I'll lift my eyebrow and I'll be like, well, tell me more and tell me why, right? The why is so important. And tell me, tell me the background and how did you study that? Because that's what say, right scientists do. We banter and we question and then mm -hmm. we're like, oh, okay, I understand. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that is different. Yes. You should pause, yeah. And, and then, you know, realizing, I was like, how many common milkweed did we sell over the years? <laughs> it's almost like, please bring your plants back. We will replace. No, but <laughs> yeah, how do we undo that? We're working hard to undo it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I'm the same way, because I remember a couple of years ago, um, somebody, I don't know who it was anymore, I don't remember, emailed me or Facebook messaged me and asked me about this thing with Georgia and common milkweed not being oh, funny. not being native. I was like, I've never heard that. Every map shows it. And then we were talking not too long ago. And I was like, I'm thinking back to myself, oops, because that that conversation email, whatever, just kind of flashed in my head. I was like, oh, um, yeah, now I know and, better. <laughs> and I would not have known. None of us would have known if Tom Patrick hadn't slowed down. And, you know, he. He is a ground truthing, he was a ground truthing botanist. So he's standing there in the wild, looking at where the plants are and, and not just accepting it, but thinking about it. Well, hang on, they're in this ditch right beside a mailbox, right beside a garden. And they seem to increase here in front of this old homestead. And, you know, he took the time to wonder and, and examine and think. And, I just, oh, what I did is I looked at the map and went, all right, good, we're going to sell it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like, hell no. And I'm, yeah, grateful. How wonderful to work with many different types of minds. And he was, 
It's a great field blindness. Yes, exactly. Because yeah, I, I'm, I'm did the same thing. I looked at the map and said, okay, we're good. Mm -hmm. And I can see how it could be highly aggressive and cause issues in a state where it isn't native to, or in environments where it's not native to, because even where it is native and grows everywhere, it is very aggressive. I mean, <laughs> here in Kentucky, I tell people all the time, if you're looking for one that you can plant in your suburban yard and have it play nice with mm -hmm. everything else in your garden beds, that's not common milkweed. It, it's not going to work here. Do rose milkweed or swamp milkweed, whichever way you want to call it. Right. Uh, that one's your tall pink milkweed that plays nice with everything and isn't going to pop up all over your yard, all over your neighbor's yard. Right. And do all that stuff. I mean, you, you still have to know the, your plants and right. what their personalities are. Shannon, that is such a good point. And we've all talked to so many people who are they're frustrated, like that story about I scratched wildflower seeds into my Georgia clay soil and they didn't come up. And I'm like, well, let's start from the beginning. You know, let's work yes. on your soil. Let's find it. They get the appropriate plants. And maybe in Georgia, it's hard to start things from seed. Maybe we have to start with plugs. Some things we can see, but maybe we want we need to get a head start because our soils are challenged now and our weed pressures are growing, our, our seasons are ever longer. But that choice about which plant, and they're like, oh, I, I grabbed some seeds of this tall goldenrod and put it in my garden. Like, well, you just invited a wild friend to come stay in your home. <laughs> they're gonna be a guest that's you know loud at the party all the time. So right, you're right, the right species, the right milkweed, the right goldenrod, we, we like to promote the smaller species. And I let Solidago altissima tall goldenrod go in a meadow that my husband and I have been restoring for uh, a good mm, 17 years, maybe, and from old field to meadow towards prairie. And I was like, oh, that's native. It's fine. It's on the edges. It's doing great. And then two years later, I'm hand treating <laughs> 10,000 stems cut, dab, cut, dab with a little paintbrush bottle, judiciously applying herbicide to just call back a, a native plant, but it's a colonizer and it was absorbing all the space and deleting our diversity on the site. So I had to, I had to ring that party wild man back. <laughs> I'm assigning personalities now to species. Uh, yeah. 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 And I think that's, I think that really is a key point is that you have to think about where it's at and what your goals are and what you want it to do. Because yes. yeah, I've got a couple of different tall golden rods. I think I haven't actually gone out there and keyed them, but right. there should be a couple of out there usually are in Kentucky mm -hmm. out in our old fields that we're letting go. And then, mm -hmm. like you said, starting to work towards moving it back to meadow, prairie, savannah type thing but yeah my husband and I are starting to have the conversation of okay how much do we let the golden rod go mm -hmm. what are we going to do right now there's mm -hmm. there's enough space for other things I'm not too worried about calling the golden rod back I'd rather concentrate on the Johnson weed yeah um, Johnson grass and yes rescue and some of those things and True. the golden rod being aggressive helps to curtail some of that um I agree I agree but, you're right yeah so it's picking and choosing, but that's one that I tell people all the time. Don't plant that one in your yard here. Here's a few that you can pick from for friendly yard ones that right. are going to play nice. Right. And then you won't be so frustrated and be feel like you're constantly eating and then you're disparaged about native plants and you're yeah lumping them all. Right. That's a yeah. really good point. And your point about if you have the space or if you have other good diversity on your land those maybe tall gold rods the colonizers they are culled by naturally by the the competition on site and that's a good point because in our old field restoration we were early days so we were you know still in the tall fescue so what diversity we had we were really trying to to protect and and increase and um if we'd had, I think if we'd had more native warm season grasses already on site, then that golden rod wouldn't have been able to come in like it did. It was just, it was like, oh, there's a party here. We're going to come in and, and not leave, <laughs> just keep going. And 
Yeah. So being early days in restoration, that would be one to watch out for. But if you've got a more mature site, then I get it. You're right. It's okay. And big eye invasive plants, right? Like Johnson grass, rivet. Yeah. Those are the things that you want to spend your time. You go, we got to prioritize. <laughs> Definitely. And right now my property has uh, pretty much, you name it, we got it mm -hmm. of the big ones, right. whether that's tree of heaven, Atlantis, princess tree, Polonia. Yes. Uh, we've got beefsteak plant. Yes. Uh, are you familiar with that? Um, it's, gorilla? Yes. It's a big problem in Athens, actually. Yes. It is. Yeah, it's a big problem here too. I mean, microstigium, the stilt grass. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got them all. And so, and of course, Johnson grass and everything like that in the field. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to worry about the goldenrod right now. No, I like the goldenrod. Right. The pollinators like the goldenrod. Exactly. Good point. I'm going to get rid of the other things because like you said, you have to prioritize. And then when I have those wilder areas that, especially um, even in a flower bed, if it's kind of a wilder flower bed, sure. yeah, I have no problem putting my aggressives against each other and then letting them fight it out and see who wins. And right, right. It becomes an experiment. Plus it's fun. <laughs> well, that, that's another good point you make, Shannon, that because you're bringing species back to the land in your garden or in your meadow grassland area, that's wonderful. You're increasing the biodiversity, you're increasing the competition. And in our old field site we were starting out we were we were working to get the invasives out and you know like the tall fescue and all the other things that were probably in the Japanese honeysuckle still crying about that Japanese honeysuckle oh yes I know oh but now that we're getting ahead and we've got some more competition I think not that goldenrod may I'm I'm less scared of it now that I was because our site's catching up because we've been interplanting and uh, doing a little overseeding and just and through conservation mowing micro burns we are encouraging the natives and warm season grasses so they once they've they're holding the site then you're right everything can relax the natives on their land they've got it we can relax in our gardening we can relax in our management we're in a management phase instead of a constant restoration phase and, and that's a good point too is to bring out is that every site's going to be slightly different yes. and it's going to be the site and what's already there and what needs to be done and what's most critical at that instant in time right. because you can't do everything at once nobody can right. and looking at what your goals are and what you're able to do yes. as well and I mean even two places right next to each other two neighbors are going to go at it slightly differently because mm -hmm they're different people and have different goals and resources and skills and time yes. and everything's going to be slightly different. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And, and that is absolutely wonderful. But the, it's like that Tom Patrick lesson to slow down and look at your site and then look at yourself and think about how much, how much time do you have? And then what is really pressing? And if you have big eye invasive plants, those are those are going to need your attention, and so how are you? How are you, can you start to get at them little by little, and and then how can you replace them? And it's doable. It's but you're right. It's take take a minute to think. Let's think about this for a second. And there's lots of wonderful resources and native plant nurseries and botanical gardens and nature centers to go to now. I mean, native plants have arrived state by state. We have young people coming to our plant sales asking for natives for their dorm room window or their balcony or the, you know i'm in love with young people coming to our plant sales and they're knowledgeable about the decline of pollinators and they want to plant you know i don't i have house plants and i want to put something on my balcony to help bees all right let's do this here's a mountain mint. this will this will do great <laughs> yes Mm -hmm. So what are some of the ones that you would recommend for those small areas, the balconies and stuff? Because that's something that everybody is looking for. And I get that question a lot as well. And I know Georgia, Kentucky, yeah, probably going to be some differences, but I'm guessing there's probably going to be some overlap too, if not in the species, then at least in the genera. That's right. You know, and I've been hearing that and among colleagues too. 
talking state to state, if we get the genera going in our gardens and in our restoration sites, we're doing great. Yes, we would like to always support the species, especially in restoration sites, but in home gardens, if we can get at the genera, it's a good point. Um, plants that we love, Carolina lupin, we're in spring, so my brain goes to Carolina lupin. That's the Mopsis villosa. Phlox paniculata, any of the phloxes. It's like, right? It's almost like yes. any of the phloxes, any of the pycnanthemums, the mountain mints. I think on our mm -hmm. website, uh, we have five listed that we recommend. It's under the Georgia Pollinator Plants of the Year program. And colleagues got together in the green, these are green industry colleagues and scientists and ecologists and talked about some really wonderful native plants or wonderful pollinator supporting plants. They didn't have to be native, but they kind of all turned out to be. So Carolina lupin, mountain mints, the pycnanthemum, monardas, gosh, any phlox. Echinaceas are, of course, wonderful. Rudbeckias, coreopsis, all these genera that just make us gush. And then we've in some native grasses, especially warm season grasses. And the little ones, like little blue stem or split beard. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Daryl Morrison, he's a landscape architect, described planting split beard on the western side of your garden or your patio in a pot so that the setting sun shines through those florets. And I did that and doggone it if he wasn't right. It's just so beautiful. Those fuzzy, fuzzy little florets. Um, yeah, that's one of the grasses I'm not familiar with, but I'm not familiar with a lot of the grasses, so. Well, you know, and I wasn't either, and I stomped my feet and pouted so badly being stubborn about learning grasses, and a wonderful woman in Georgia, Elaine Nash, she's a soil conservation scientist, and she self-taught her the botany of Georgia, and, and the grasses, and not just the grasses, but um, their plant communities, how to collect their seed, how to grow them from seed, and how to get them back on the land. I mean, she's amazing, and she's been our mentor for many, many years, Elaine Nash. And shoo, I remember how many times I'm like, one more time, Elaine, the difference between a cool season grass and a warm season grass is like, okay, deep breath. <laughs> one more time, Jennifer. I just, and, but it's like anything, right? You spend more time with somebody, you, you call a plant by name, you know, you put that floret in a, in a vase by your computer with a little sticky note that says who that is and you spend time with it and then it starts to stick because you're establishing a relationship. But I was slow to come around that grass corner, to be honest, but now I love them. <laughs> Split beard's a favorite, it's a most favorite. I'm gonna have to look that one up. Look that one up, it is lovely. It's a great plant for pots or gardens. Do you know if it's in Kentucky? You know, I'm, I'm not officially, but I, it seems like I'm thinking it ought to be. Okay. <laughs> but I haven't set um, encyclopedic map of species in my head, like some of our beautiful colleagues in the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative that carry this detail in their heads. Yes. Thank goodness for books and websites. Yes. Yes. I agree because I don't have the maps in my head either. <laughs> I don't. I don't. But I want to say it, it ought to be. Okay. See, we'll Google that soon. Yes, I will definitely look that up. But yeah, so you named a bunch of the ones that I really like in pots too. Oh, good. oh Eastern Columbine works really well. Love Columbine. Yes. Absolutely love Columbine. Yes. And it spreads and it's satisfying. You can share some seeds with your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Get the seeds in those little paper vases, just like don't tip it, keep it upright. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, all the spring ephemerals for sure, but those are hard to get. But yes. things like um, Fluxta varicata, the blue flux, mm -hmm. is one of my most favorite, right? You're going to hear me say this. And then geranium maculatum, the wild geranium, it's one of my most favorites. And then the pacra, we call them butterweeds. Mm -hmm. yep. Butterweed or ragwort? Yes, yes. Those are also one of my most favorites. So. And, and then the all planted together, right? It's mm -hmm. just so beautiful. And then you have, and planted in clumps as, you know, or let them spread, plant just a few plugs and then let them spread in your garden, let them go to seed. 
can always share with friends, but those they're well behaved, they're beautiful, they happen to be ecologically amazing. Yes. Right? Looks and personality, all the things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all my favorites. It, I know spring, and then we'll get in the summer. I'm like, these are all my favorites, and we get in the fall. These are my most favorite. So. Yes, I was nice. I did not ask you uh, and will not ask you what your favorite one is, the favorite native plants are, because I already know yours is going to be just like me. The one that I'm looking at at this moment in time or that I'm thinking of at this moment in time is usually my is, favorite. That's the truth. Thank you, Shannon. Right. I just started saying, and this is my most favorite. Mm -hmm. And then in talks, if I'm doing a PowerPoint, I put a heart shape by them. But like every plant in the image <laughs> on the screen has a heart shape yes. next to it. Like, you know, you asked. So here's 96 of my most favorite spring wildflowers. Yes. There we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. And who says I can't have more than one favorite? They're all my favorites. Exactly. Exactly. Love is a circle. Yes. It's bigger. Right. So I know. One of the things that you talk about a lot in your presentations and that we might want to talk about a little bit here mm -hmm. um, is cues to care because oh. with native plants becoming more and more popular, I mean, yeah. yes, we can plant them just like any other plant, just there's a native instead of an exotic, but there's kind of this misconception that native plants are always kind of these wild and crazy and free form and formal wild prairie looks and I love that and I tend to do that a lot but that doesn't always fit in in many like communities and neighborhoods right. so those cues right. to care can be so important do you want to share some of that with us yes I'd love to and you know these are all little nuggets of goodness that I grab from other amazing people these phrases and observations my colleague here at the Botanical Garden, she's our conservation horticulturist, Heather Alley, leads our Connect to Protect Garden, which is a program to help people garden with natives. And it could be in a potted garden, it could be your mailbox garden, it could be a perennial bed, it could be a meadow. And sometimes we have money to go to cities and help them put in these gardens. We have money to help you put in a native plant garden in, in front of your city hall or something. And we were getting pushback, like you just said, Shannon, that plants, native plant, oh, that native plant garden's gonna look messy. And we do all the things and we show the pictures and we, so Heather designed and built a very formal native plant garden planted in patches. And it's still, it is gorgeous. And when the plants are big and they're going to seed and they're doing their things and it's wonderful and she's letting them go to seed intentionally, what sets it off, what gives people a breath is a very firm stone edge. It's got a raised hard edge, a very clean, precise edge that's curving, maybe 20 inches tall stone paver stacked up so that the garden in its seasons as different species come in and out, um, they can get a little excited <laughs> as they go to seed and they're fluffy with their seed heads and their pappas and such, or they're brown, but it's, but it's got that hue of care on the side that helps you know this is intentional. And that's gotten us observing cues of care. We in our meadow, we had neighbors asking when we were gonna mow those plants down, Oh, it's sweet. You don't see that as beautiful. So my husband put um, field stones on the edge and created a very precise border. And we've seen it since. A mode edge will also do that. A very clean, precise border. So you, you don't want, wish to spend all your days mowing your entire property. So you mow a very precise edge and then you let the rest come up. Maybe in a neighborhood, in a a neighborhood that has certain rules, you have a gravel path that stays very precise and clean. And you have an, an edge to that bed that is very precise. In your garden can go through its seasonality and look intentional. So there's intentional cues of care that, that no, we, we fully expect this to be tall in places and going to seed in places, going to seed in the best ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
but that it, it helps people realize that it's not just neglected. And we're getting this a lot with our, our Georgia Department of Transportation partners. They are working to change the management of roadsides for creating more grassland habitat, more pollinator habitat. And we have lots of, we being us and our, our partners have lots of conversations with GDOT and they get pushback because if their roadsides are not mowed tightly, they're viewed as uncared for, they're viewed as poor. This is, you know, you, this is neglected. We don't have money to care for our roadsides. And GDOT is working really hard to educate people the other way and say, this is intentional, this is beautiful. And I was just in a call yesterday with some GDOT colleagues and that safety strip that they have to maintain that's that, you know, shorn for cars to pull off safely. I was like, there, there's your cue of care. And then the back slope, let's reduce the mowing cycles, right? And, and let those plants come up and let wildflowers bloom and go to seed. And maybe we're going to mow twice a year instead of as often as, as we've worked ourselves up to. Mm -hmm. And that'll serve as a cue of care that it's intentional. But they get phone calls, they get phone calls. So we're, you know, it's push pull marketing. It's like, we can tell people, I can convince them if I can get a 20 minute conversation with them, but it's hard to get 20 minute conversations with Georgians all over the place. So we need quick ways to teach people that this is intentional. These are cues of care. This is, this is beautiful. Come see, come see why this is beautiful. Yes. And I think that's something that, especially as more and more municipalities and states try to go to those beautiful roadsides that have right. those beautiful wildflowers and create that habitat there. And oh my gosh, they can be beautiful sometimes. I mean, really gorgeous. But again, I mean, I've talked to many different groups on informal situations where it's the same sort of thing. I mean, it's viewed as being, like you said, neglect. If it's not right. shorn all the way, short grass, as far as you can go over to the fence row or wherever the bank is or, but right. no, there can be some gorgeous stuff there. And as we've talked about in a, several of the other podcast episodes I've done recently mm -hmm. with Kyle Leibarger and with Jeremy French, I mean, sometimes those mm -hmm. areas are remnant prairies that are very old, very rare plants sometimes that right have survived and hung on there, but that's like one of the few places that they can be found anymore. That's exactly right, Shannon. Those remnant prairies, those little pockets, which have survived because of the disturbance of mowing. Mm -hmm. The mowing is just fine, but maybe we go back to way it was done 20 years ago, and we are gonna have to spot spray invasive, big eye invasives, capital I, Johnson grass, the others, but reduce broadcast spraying, go to spot spraying, and then conservation mowing because there are those beautiful relic prairies, those little remnants of goodness. And we need to, right, we're learning how much we need to increase them. And GDOT and Georgia Power, Forest Service for sure, state parks, they're all working to change their mowing regimes, their management regimes. And and they're asking the botanical gardens and the nature centers to help us tell these stories of why this is beautiful. And some people, they get it, but some people bristle. Mm -hmm. And and I have you know, actually said to district leaders in GDOT, like, send the calls to me, send them to me. Like, I'll, you know, let me have 10 minutes on the phone with them. I'll see what I can do. But I think we'll get there. I think we'll get there. I think another, something else that we've been strategic about, um, we did a, a pocket prairie planting with GDOT partners. So we usually we plant plugs, small, like if you bought a six pack of pansies, that size, a six pack, we plant plugs because they establish real well. But we did choose some more bigger size, some one gallon showy plants, some, um, and we planted them to the front so they could have, and we planted them in patches so that you could see the characters of the play. You could see the clump of color and, and, and see a species. And then in the distance, it may be spread with all its friends, but in the front being very intentional, bigger specimens, bigger patches of color. 
and then let the back go, let it spread as it, as it wishes. And, and it'll thread and do its thing. And it'll, it'll, it'll also be beautiful, but making it look very purposeful, repeating the clumps of color, you know, purple, red, yellow, purple, red, yellow, and just keep it going, yeah. So the people start to see. Well, I know you guys in Georgia have some amazing projects going on too. And I want to make sure we talk about some of those. Oh, nice. And let our listeners in Georgia know about because yeah, you've got some cool stuff going on down there. Yeah, we we have several initiatives and we are all about native plants. So you know our hearts. And if you come, please come to the State Botanical Garden. It is free. Our parking is free. Just come on in. We're open sunrise to sunset as you're traveling to the southeast. And we have garden displays of all kinds, all kinds of collections, like most botanical gardens do. And so we welcome plants as long as they're not invasive to be on display and to be in people's gardens. But we really, we, we plead, we cheer, we try to convince people to incorporate natives into every space they can. And you'll see that at walking our gardens. It'll be a certain garden selection, a curated collection, but then it'll weave into some more natives. I mean, our curators are amazing transitioning those stories. Um, we have Connect to Protect, which we borrowed that phrase from Fairchild Tropical Garden. And it's about Doug Tallamy's ideas. Um, if, if we all plant a few native plants in all our little spaces, whatever our space is, we will support wildlife, Georgia wildlife, Southeast wildlife, um, biodiversity. And amazing how wildlife will find it. The bees will find your plants on your windowsill. The monarchs found the native plants on the George, on the what the New York High Line in the middle of Manhattan. Or, oh my gosh! So connect to protect. We have the Georgia Pollinator Plants of the Year, where we're working to increase native plants in the trade for display, for restoration. And we, uh, my colleague Heather Alley, often gives growers seeds and shares her techniques for how to increase them to just get these plants moving in the trade so they can be more easily available for for Georgia gardeners. We have the Georgia Plant Conservation Alliance, which we're very proud of. The the partners that worked on the critically imperiled plants. And it's interesting in working with endangered plants, what we're realizing is we can't always just focus on the endangered species. We gotta remember to restore the whole community we had an endangered plant that was failing to reproduce, not getting good pollinator visits. And a colleague was like, well, have you planted for the bee that pollinates that? Have you planted it so it supports that bee throughout the whole year? We were so focused on the endangered plant. So again, native plants and their companion plants in the whole plant community. And then something also we're proud of is the certificate native plants. So if folks want to learn about native plants in all the ways, from gardening to ecology to classic botany, field identification, winter identification, horticulture, all the things. We have a series of classes and you can, if you go through the curriculum, you get you get at your pace, there's no timeline. You get a, an official certificate in native plants from the State Botanical Garden. And truly that, that's our source of volunteers, people that are botanically trained and can come help us in the field to collect seeds or to monitor endangered plants. They're, they're getting this amazing training and then they become unpaid staff and much really valued volunteers working with us arm in arm, which we're real proud of. So, and then we have our invasive species removal program. So it's, we talk about all these trails going up the same mountain of conservation. It could be a gardening with natives. It could be actual restoration prairie restoration, it could be removing invasives, it could be working on endangered plants, but these all these trails going up the same mountain to, to just get more native plants on the ground for all the good reasons. Mm -hmm. And then we collaborate with our sister and brother gardens and nature centers and universities throughout Georgia and we share programs and collections and projects and work together. It's, just, it's a big lift. So we're all lifting together. But it takes that because nobody can do it by themselves. And I mean, you've got all these, like you said, other colleges and nature centers and botanical gardens and other conservation organizations and agencies. 
but then you've also yes. got the private individuals and the volunteers who are out there and do because it's needed. And especially in a state like Georgia or Kentucky or pretty much anywhere in the East, most of our land is privately owned. Right. So we've got to have everybody out there doing it and working on it and interested in it really to make a difference. That is the golden nugget you've gotten at the heart. You're right. Most of the land is privately held in Georgia too. And we really need to, people to care. You know, when I started my career in plant conservation, I figured I was going to, you know, I wanted to do something very applied. I was going to do this work for as long as I could. And then I was going to pass the box, the bag, the, the, the work. So the next person I'm like, okay, ta- tag, I'm tagging out. Now it's your turn. You carry that box as far as you can. And I, it's been, I guess it's 2014 in partnering with Southeastern Grasslands Initiative and partnering with scientists and other disciplines like ornithologists, the decline of our songbirds, the decline of our ground birds, the decline of grasslands in the Southeast. And the phrase that the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative uses that 25 years may be too late. You know, when I started my career in conservation, I, for Southeastern conservation, I didn't realize that time pressure. And now here I am 25 years in, and we know kids not have a time pressure. And so now when I talk to audiences, I'm really pouring the heart out and I'm saying, listen, y'all, I'm, I'm asking legitimately, I really need you to plant a few natives in your home garden or your balcony or your mailbox or your windowsill because we're running out of time. We're going to start losing some bees and butterflies and birds we may already be losing birds and and it is centered around grassland habitat woodland habitat open habitat open space and getting people to see open space because people have forgotten and i i did not learn grasslands conservation as a young person coming up through graduate school of course in the coastal plain longleaf pine ecosystem absolutely but for the piedmont in the mountains i wasn't taught this yeah and So I'm saying to people with my biggest open heart, we've got time pressure. We need to be mowing differently on roadsides. We need to be planting natives in every space we can and letting plants go to seed and seeing beauty differently. Plants going to seed is beautiful in in all the seasons of their lives. Come look at this echinacea, this conehead. Look how prickly this is. Look at these awns. Yeah. So, and, you know, on one hand, it's, it's a big lift and we're scared. And on the other hand, but this is so doable. And, oh my gosh, here's the solution. Plant some lovely natives in your garden. (laughs) It's doable and it's joyful. So let's go. Here we go. We're going to do this together. Right. So as long as we're all doing it together, it only takes a little bit for every one of us with it. And yeah, I love leaving the seed heads because one, they're gorgeous just by themselves. Right. But then two, I love the birds and the birds will come in and they'll eat on them all winter long. And right. even right now I've got a patch of golden rods and it's the tall mm-hmm. field golden rods. I let go mm-hmm. to seed and to flower right outside my office window and everybody mm-hmm. would come by and they're like, what's that big patch? Because it's in the middle of the yard, but I saw it was all goldenrod. So I was like, okay, yeah. we're just going to leave this because I went to watch the go- I watch everything outside my office window, all the pollinators and stuff. And then the birds have come in from all winter long nice. and we're eating the seeds. And now I've got warblers checking it out for new oh, insects wonderful. that are getting on it. And I mean, I've seen some of the first warblers of the season on this little patch of goldenrod right outside my window literally already this year and it's been fun now it's getting to the point where it's like okay we're gonna have to cut it down mm-hmm. before too much longer but I keep kind of hesitating it keeps raining that's my excuse <laughs> yeah oh, that's a good story that's a good point so uh, a little tip you may know this Shannon but I was recently taught about the waddle which is putting pairs of sticks in the ground and, and laying cut stems. So it makes sort of like a, a little fence. Mm-hmm. 
a little homemade grassy stem fence. And so I've, I've had several friends. Lauren Muller was a colleague who taught me about the wattle. To, if you must, must, must cut down your stems. And eventually we do, mm -hmm. or, we, you know, or they start to snap. Then just lay them in this little vertical fence, this little paired stick spaced a foot apart, maybe six pairs, and then horizontally you're laying the stems in between and, then, and let that go. And then you can do it so it looks intentional to queue up care. I usually, I used to just do a pile, but now this looks very intentional. A little straw fence on the edge around my pawpaws in my garden and by my blueberries. And then the bees can harvest out and, you know, the baby bees that are in those stems. And, and like you said, the birds will pick out around on the bugs on those stems. Um, I did build my first wattle this winter and it's a humble wattle. <laughs> It's a little more intentional than a pile. <laughs> Some people really do beautiful things. You can Google images. I, and I guess it's something that maybe came out of other countries throughout the planet, but I'm catching up on this. Yes. Yeah. I always forget about waddles. I've seen them, like you said, on the internet, Facebook and stuff like that, mm -hmm. pictures of them. But yeah, I tend to do, okay, pile mm -hmm. those stems here or set them up here. Um, oh. Yeah. If, if I have space. And it's, I mean, I live idea. in the country, so I don't have to worry about HOA rules or anything like that. Right. So if I have a place where I can kind of stand them up after I've cut off the stems, mm. I will, because at least then they're still in the same orientation and all that good stuff. Otherwise, I do like yeah. a little pile off in the corner and okay, move on. That's a good idea. The little vertical stands. But yeah, models are really good, especially for areas that you need more of those cues to care. Right, cues of care. I live in, a uh, husband and I live in a downtown area. We don't have the HOA, but we have a small garden. And so, right, so space is precious, but you need stick piles and we have our cut piles and we have our compost and, and it's all part of the process. But the waddle, it's pretty cute, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think a an American toad could jump over it, but it's pretty cute. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you want to share with us? Because this has been fun. And I mean, we could talk forever, but. I, I know. I really do love our conversation, Shin. Um, anything else I want to say? Well, I want to say thank you. And I want to say thank you for your podcast. I want to say thank you for your, your blog and your outreach on behalf of Native Plants and Wildlife, because you really are so good at helping people see and pause and look and be curious. So thank you for your work and your voice and your heart. We, we are celebrating you in, in Georgia and you have many fans down here. So thank you. And thank you for this chance to have a conversation with you. I'm grateful to be part of Backyard Ecology. So thank you. You're welcome. And thank you so much for the kind words. And yeah, thank you for everything that you're doing too, because I mean, you're doing the same thing, helping to get out the word and spreading the word about native plants and get people interested and just everything that goes with it. I mean, we probably established this when we started out this whole conversation talking about um, spiders, when which we right? just completely went <laughs> off on. But yeah, it, it's, you can't look at one little thing for very long if you've got this curious scientist, naturalist mind without then seeing something else on it. And all of a sudden, that's a new interest in everything's connecting. You just got to keep going through and looking at all the cool stuff. And this leads to that. And that leads to this. And all of a sudden, well, we spent an hour plus talking about all kinds of fun things. Yes. Yes. And it's fun to find another kindred soul, kindred heart. So thank you. Yes. Thank you too. But yes. So if anybody, especially our listeners in Georgia. Okay. Want mm -hmm. to know more about native plants and starting to grow native plants or some of these rare plants and think that maybe they've got something different on their property because that's where we're finding a lot of the rare and unusual plants now are on people's private property. So maybe they have something different that mm -hmm. they're curious about. Can they get in touch with you and find out more about all this stuff? Yes. So 
people can contact me by email. And uh, my email is my name, J Seska, so J C E S K A at U G A dot edu. Our all the staff is on our State Botanical Garden website, botgarden.uga.edu. If you scroll down to the bottom of the homepage, you can, there's a, a link for staff and our email addresses are there. If you go to the conservation tab, you can read about our programs and our outreach. And we have that for sure on milkweeds and we have for sure uh, information about recommended native plant nurseries in Georgia and the Southeast and recommended native plants for gardens and how to propagate them and all kinds of goodness. And you just cued my mind, Shannon. There's an iNaturalist project. Oh, yes. And it's called the Georgia Grasslands Initiative, iNaturalist project. So if people are curious about what they have and they snap a photo on the iNaturalist app and they link it to the Georgia Grasslands Initiative project page we can help them identify that plant. And people are finding some remarkable species in their gardens and in their back property and on roadsides. So please, please, yes, that would be wonderful. If people wanted to check that out and get involved and we can get excited about native plants together. Yes, and I will definitely have your contact information in the show notes. I will have a link to oh, nice. the Botanical Gardens page. Um, okay. I may even go ahead and pull out that one on the yes. appropriate milkweeds right. and go ahead and put that as a separate link because I think that's really important to highlight. Thank you. Um, and okay. I will also do the iNaturalist page because yes, I forgot that too until you brought that up because that's a really good way for people to get involved. And Yeah, and we need them. We need them. We need them to go be curious and take pictures of flowers. So. Yes, exactly. Well, this has been great and we may have to have you on again because it's just fun to have these conversations and that would be my honor. about all the fun stuff going on outside and that yeah. we're finding yeah let's do this again i would love that truly thank you yes well until then thanks again and have a great day thank you you too shannon i appreciate jennifer taking the time to talk with us it is always fun to talk with and learn from Someone as knowledgeable, passionate, and caring as Jennifer. Jennifer and her colleagues at the State Botanical Garden of Georgia at UGA are doing some amazing work, and I am grateful for all of their efforts to help others learn about and grow native plants. If you're in Georgia, then I encourage you to check out some of their programs. Before I wrap this up, I want to ask a favor of you. If you find value in the Backyard Ecology content, please consider joining our community of supporters. There are many ways you can support Backyard Ecology, both financially and non-financially. Learn more at www.backyardecology.net slash join dash us. And until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.